The Unlikely Heroes of Economics, Dennis Kucinich, the American Monetary Institute, and Occupy Wall Street. So, in this series of interviews in which we have been chronicling Occupy Wall Street since almost its beginning one year ago, and oh yes, happy birthday Occupy, uh, we've had the benefit of hearing from guests who have both praised and cautioned us as to the eventual difference that OWS will or can make in America's history. In particular, the impact it will have in the way that we deal with the most dismal science, economics. Now, to those purposes, we couldn't have a better guest today than Stephen Zarlinga, someone who understands what it takes to be an activist and battle the status quo, but who also has economic street creds as well as academic degrees to back up his calls for change. Uh, Stephen draws on 35 years of experience in the world of finance, securities, insurance, mutual funds, real estate, futures trading, published 20 books on money, banking, politics, philosophy, uh, the most recently titled The Lost Science of Money. And just as importantly, or more so, he is also director of the American Monetary Institute, which can be found at www.monetary.org. Welcome to the show today, Steve. Uh, thank you, Jerry, for having me, and uh, thank you for those comments. <laughs> well, I knew going into this interview that our allotted 15 minutes was going to be sorely tested. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Attempting to distill what you've learned and taught over the past 40, 50 years, and then somehow weave in the Occupy movement, and Dennis Kucinich is a bit much to ask, but we will do it if you don't mind my pointed questions. Think we can do that? Yeah, sure. Okay. And so, you think so. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the two things that the listener will immediately want to understand. Who are you? What do you stand for? And what are your views on the Occupy movement? Uh, well, the American Monetary Institute, founded in '96, uh, to to present in in uh, normal terms that people can understand what is happening with our banking and monetary system because the monetary system can be a tremendous source of justice in a society or the opposite and clearly we're in a situation where our monetary and banking system is working against justice against the nation essentially so uh, we try to make clear what has to be done to fix that and that is based on a historical view primarily we don't do this uh, based on theoretical ideas we look at what's actually happened and figure out why and then apply that to the present for example in, in the book the lost science of money first 23 chapters are historical periods of time starting essentially with aristotle moving forward and Chapter 24 then says, all right, with what we have now learned about monetary system, what do we have to do to the present system to make it fair? Well, you know, what I understand that you're famous for, uh, Steve, are your challenges to what you call the Achilles heel of American capitalism, and that's the private control of the nation's monetary system. Now, this would appear to be a pay grade or two above the Occupy complaint about Wall Street greed and abuse of the banking system, but are they connected? They are. They're very much connected. But uh, Wall Street, ha the Wall Street people, have to look a little bit deeper than simply Wall Street, because it's the way that the banking system is structured and who creates our money. You see, the Constitution places that power in the Congress. In uh, uh, Article 1, Section 8, Congress has the power to create our money. But what they did in 1913 is they delegated that legally but incorrectly, and it was a bad idea, to the Federal Reserve System, which is essentially a private group. Now, uh, people think it's part of our government. It's not really part of our government. And um, the results have been disastrous. It took only 20 years between 1913 and uh, 1933 for them to bring down the entire country. They brought America to its knees with the Great Depression. They got off scot-free. I mean, uh, well, getting because, off, yeah, getting off scot-free seems to be the the present scenario of of something that this, you're uh, that you're talking about now. When you say that the monetary system, being in the hands of this Federal Reserve 
is really a, a gaming table where the cards are stacked and the dice are shaved. How did we get ourselves into that situation? Oh, it's, it's a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Can it be rectified? When you say, how did we get into it? Yes. Uh, this has been going on for a long time. Uh, Adam Smith uh, was not, although he's the father of economics, uh, he made he made uh, several huge errors. If we want to give him um, benefit of the doubt, he he put forward the idea that money must be gold and silver, or he consolidated that idea. Now, what we've learned at the American Monetary Institute is that the way in which a society defines money, how it conceptualizes the nature of money, that determines who controls the money. Now, whoever controls the money will control the society over time, not every election, but over time, they will determine the direction of society. So this is a key question. Who's controlling the money system? Congress uh, should have that power. They delegated it to the Fed. And what, what has to be done now and what Kucinich has put into the into the hopper there, that power must be returned to the Congress. You cannot have a privatization of who controls the money system well, because they cannot help but run it for their own benefit. It's in the nature of people to do that, which will lead me to questions about Congress running it. But let's talk about my favorite person, uh, one well, of them, Congressman Dennis Kucinich. And yes. his, his attempt to institute monetary reform by way of a bill called H.R. 2990, the Need Act. Uh, yes. So as you were an important ally in writing this bill, tell yes. us about it and what you think we need to understand. Let's look at the three. First of all, it takes back the power from the Federal Reserve System, puts it into the Congress, and a monetary authority is is uh, constituted there. And there's every reason to think that that would work. In fact, during the periods in our own history, when the when the uh, uh, government was in control of money, these were the best monetary periods that we have had. History shows that. Now, what Dennis's bill does, there are three main parts of it. First of all, it nationalizes the Federal Reserve System. It, or he doesn't care for that word, so let's use the terminology. It dismantles the present Federal Reserve, keeps any good parts of it within the U.S. Treasury. That's the first step. That alone would not do it, and we know that because the Bank of England was nationalized in the 1940s, and they are ended, they've ended up at the same place that we have, where 97% uh, of Brit money is created by the banking system, and it's about the same in America. So simply nationalizing the, the central banking system is not enough. You, have to, you also have to stop the banks from continuing to have the power to create money. In America, that is done through what is called the fractional reserve system, where banks can lend more money than they have, in essence. And that is uh, simply an accounting technique. And Kucinich's HR 2990, the second main thing it does, it changes the accounting rules. If banks want to lend money, they have to have money to lend. It's that simple. Now, what does that mean? That means that money is no longer debt. Our present system doesn't really have money. It has debt. Banks well, are... Right. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's address that because for a layman like myself, yeah. uh, someone struggling to understand this thing called debt, and by the way, my background is in debt and debt collection. That's my world. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine that? Yeah. And, here, and so when I look at debt, uh, I look at it as an onerous thing, and it always boggled my mind that a bank would would lend me money on a home and then uh, look at that as the entire amount of that home loan as being their money, which they've lent out, and then lend out more money to other people. Now, I'm not saying this well, so why don't you describe it better for the listener? Okay. They didn't really lend you money to start with. They created a credit in your account, uh, or which is also a debt that you owed them. They created that through an accounting uh, 
technique or trick. So it's was it, not so, really money. They didn't. So, they never actually had the money to lend you. So with a with an accounting trick, uh, let's say I have a four hundred thousand dollar home. Yep. Uh, I'm now in debt. I owe the bank money. All they all they did was to make a an entry in their accounting system. That's uh, correct. And yes. I'm now in debt, and I owe interest now. Where yeah. does interest come in? How does this happen? That's the way the system set up, and that we change. That Cosinages Act stops that entirely. Banks are encouraged to lend money. They're not encouraged to create new money by by uh, lending credit or debt. Then who creates the money? In that system, in our system, the government will create the money as money, not as debt. See, this concept of what money really is, is it has been going out of existence until we stopped that process, the American Monetary Institute. Now, what, what, uh, what will happen with the money creation? The government creates the money and spends it into circulation, simply spends it. Where? Well, the engineers tell us that we have $2.2 trillion of infrastructure repairs that are necessary for the for the country now over the next five years. $2.2 trillion can be pretty easily uh, created and added to the system. The banks were doing, um, over a five-year period, banks were doing something like uh, seven, eight hundred uh, billion a year they were creating and putting into essentially junk, either Wall Street junk or overpriced, uh, uh, poorly structured uh, uh, mortgages and so on. So that amount is quite um, achievable. And where, where does that money go then? Uh, contractors who want to do infrastructure repair will put in a bid the same way they do now. Uh, bids will be awarded on, on uh, various bases that make sense. Uh, they will hire, the contractor will hire working people and get resources and materials. Uh, they will get paid by the government, real money, they will pay out their workers, they'll pay out for their supplies and all of, all of uh, the things they have to do to stay in business. And where does that money then go? Uh, well, a working uh, fellow will probably either put it under the mattress or in a bank account. Well, I might be as that working fellow. I might want to buy that house I just mentioned. So there I, you go. I, I'm, I just, I, I'm being very well paid because this is called real money and I'm not yes. in debt for it. But if I'm making, oh, say, $1,000 a week, how can I go out and buy that $400,000 home? Where's that money coming from? Because that's where everybody is going to put their money it's or not. under the mattress. <laughs> so instead of putting the money but under the mattress, it goes back to the government? Goes back to, it goes into a bank. Into the bank, okay. Yeah, now they're encouraged to loan that out. But they're not loaning debt. They're not loaning credit. They're loaning real, real money. money. I see. Now, it's the, quest the question is the definition of money. The concept of money is the key, the key here. Now, economists have been horrible on this. They have not done their job. One of the things we learn, Jerry, is economists don't read generally. They, they very rarely read. And I think it'd probably be nearly impossible for an economics professor to get a job in an American university if he's going to tell the truth about the money system. Uh -huh. They will find ways not to do that. They'll convince themselves for some other reason that money must be debt. Ridiculous. The so, so once upon a time, somebody made up the idea that money was debt. Yes. Uh, how well, far money back? In within, <laughs> money within our, our current system is Almost yeah. all debt. It is okay. But it doesn't. You don't have to keep that system. You you can fix the system. This system's been broken from the beginning. We had the great crash within 20 years. We've had a a, a minor crash every 10 years or so, and and now uh, we have had another major major crash. Well, which, why why don't economists propose something like this on their own? They're brilliant people, right? They're not so brilliant, Jerry. Economists are, are not really that smart. There, I mean, there are exceptions. We, we've run into a brilliant exception who works at the International Monetary Fund. He's just done a study which shows that we are on the right track. And that, that's it's called a re-evaluation of the Chicago plan. And that's on our website, by the way. Uh, you can link to that at, if you go to monetary.org. And, and, and who is this person? The guy's name? 
Yes. Uh-huh. He's the head. He's the head modeler. They call him modeler of the International Monetary Fund. Okay. His, his name, I don't know if we should get personal, yeah. but he's their top man. And he did the study on the Chicago plan. Now, the Chicago plan, something came out of Chicago, University of Chicago, before they went over to the dark side back in the 1930s. And, and um, it was a guy called Henry Simons. They were aided by, by um, other – we had great economists back then. There were smart economists then. And they proposed how to fix the system. And our, our Kucinich Act is based on the Chicago plan. Now, what the IMF uh, economist found was that the plan, he, he ran it through his computer, uh, computerized system. They didn't have those computers back then. You know, these are systems like uh, those which predict the weather, and they tell you roughly what should happen if you do certain things in the economy. He found that this works without inflation. It solves the problem. It keeps things going and humming along. And this this plan has been out there for since 1930s, being ignored by economists. So don't tell me economists are smart. Well, not, not, we, not today's economists. Now, there's a there's a phrase that is chanted on many uh, Occupy marches. Tell me. Uh, um, they got uh, bailed out. We got sold out. Yeah. Now, if that same, I've, I've always wondered if the government, instead of lending the money to the banks, had given this money directly to the population of the United States, would we, what would that have been like for us, I wonder? Good question. Good point. Well, let's, let's suppose that it was a total of $3 trillion that was uh, given one way or another to the banks. It, it's probably much more. Uh, not loaned, but actually given and benefited to them. Yes. Three trillion. If you took three trillion and gave it to the American people, there are 300 million of us. That's $10,000 for every man, woman, and child. There would be no recession. <laughs> General Motors would never have gone bankrupt. Uh -huh. Many people would keep their houses. That's $40,000 for a family of four. They gave it to the people who didn't need it. Well, they needed it at the time because their stupidity had put them in a situation where they were going to go broke and bring the whole country down, not just General Motors. So, so the, the, the complaint is very, very valid on the part of the Occupy people that the wrong people were bailed out. And definitely, totally definitely the, 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 the famous 99% were sold out. Now, Absolutely. And you're suggesting that you, uh, Dennis Kucinich, a small band of bright people are going to be able to change this. First, you have to realize, Dennis Kucinich is one of America's greatest heroes at this time. And it's, he puts forward things that make sense for America, for our, for our nation. And he has a confidence in the people of this country. He has a confidence in the future. He's, you, you, you can see so much negativity, especially on the Internet these days. And all of that is working against our psyche. Now, Dennis, uh, in putting forward this uh, NEED Act, National Emergency Employment Defense Act, has taken the single greatest step that I know of in, in recent memory, or recent history rather, to put forward something that will help this nation. And he was supported in it is supported in it by Congressman John Conyers of Detroit, who is another great congressman. Uh, and we're trying to find more Congress people who will support this act. It's still in the Congress until January the 1st or 2nd. Um, and then what happens? Then what happens, all the bills that are in Congress, in the 112th Congress, go out of existence and they have to be reintroduced into the next 113th Congress. And that is what we are working on now with Dennis, because he, he's not going to be in the next Congress. I can understand it. I know that. Uh, I felt terrible when I saw that that was happening. Well, let me talk about what it takes to be educated. I know that your institute is quite famous for that. Tell us a little bit about the institute, and I believe you have an up and upcoming uh, conference. Tell us about yes. that and, and some of the speakers, please. Well, the institute founded in '96, and what we're promoting uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
promoting the idea that Americans have to understand our money system. We hold a conference every year, and this is our eighth annual, uh, and at the end of September here in Chicago. And some of the people that are going to be there, first of all, the, the, uh, the IMF man who did that tremendous study, uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Kumoff, he's going to be there giving a talk, and we'll hold discussions on that and panels on that. We have from the, in, from the United Nations coming a brilliant, brilliant uh, man and an economist, and his name is Michael Clark, and he's, he, uh, he's had a tremendous uh, effect on things in the International Monetary Fund. At one point, he was responsible a couple of years ago for the IMF issuing another 240 billion SDRs, even though they had only issued 21 billion up till that point in time, uh, since uh, the 19, 1970, I think it was. Uh, another top guy is from Japan, and his name is Kaoru Yamaguchi. He is one of the world's top economic modelers like Kumhoff from the IMF. And we have the, the third greatest economic modeler coming, and his name is Steve Keen of Australia, who, who has a book called Debunking Economics, which tells you just how smart the economists are not. And um, let's see, who do we have? Michael Hudson is coming. I should go to the uh, to the list here. And, and well, you. before you go to that list, yes, in, yes. Any, anybody can go to uh, monetary.org, oh. and you have your 2012 conference and the list of all the speakers there. Am, am I correct? Yes. And yes. one other thing, uh, when is your conference being held? It's being held uh, September 20th through the 20th. Uh, third this year, which is really one week off from today, yes. and it's at University Center in Chicago. Okay. Now, this pretty much brings us to the closure of 15 Minutes of Fact, which we fatten oh. a little bit, but that's what I like about it. Rather than having to borrow time from you and, and spend interest, I'm actually getting the full cash value, and I, I, <laughs> I, I, I want to thank you for that. So <laughs> let, me ask one last, <laughs> let me ask one last question. Okay. Uh, Knowing what people are doing at your level, knowing what people are doing at Kucinich's level, how can people in the Occupy movement or Occupy itself become an important factor in this process? Okay. The Occupy people are important. And, and what I love about them is that they're there fighting. What they have to understand, though, is that they have to learn more. They have to learn more. Now, my book does this. It's called The Lost Science of Money. Uh, and it's in libraries. They can get it there. They cannot let themselves be mind bleeped. And this happens in this area because the economists have done such a horrible job on the question of money. It's sort of easy to pretend that some things are real when they're not. So the occupied people have to be a bit tough and a bit smart and they should listen to us more, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, I think there's definitely a two-way street that Occupy would say, and I think that I can vouch for the fact that it requires education. Uh, I can't tell you the headaches I've had to create for myself to try to understand something so that I could so I could really validate the fact that what I was doing was correct, rather than just taking that mind bleep that you were talking about or believing yeah, people yeah. and just going along to get along. Yeah, and, and there are pros out there trying to harm the situation. Yes, there uh, are. And otherwise, we wouldn't be in so much trouble. <laughs> I mean, well, we're smarter. We're smarter than that. So, but it takes work. It takes study, and um, we're here to help in that regard. And we're totally ready to help with the Occupy people if they ask. I I have spoken at the Occupy Chicago. Um, a couple of different times, and what you have to watch out for is the the Occupy people. Don't be so impatient with getting real easy answers. They're not necessarily hard, but you've got to look at the facts. You yep. have to yep. you have to be tough on that. Well, that's a you're right on all counts, and I want to thank you very much for the time that you've given us today. And I also want my listeners to know that if you need to know more about this man and the work that his institute is doing, you can write Steve directly at 
ami at taconic.net. That's A-M-I at T-A-C-O-N-I-C dot net. Or you can visit his website, monetary.org. And I suggest that you Google him as well and read some of the excellent material found about him and his institute there and at Wikipedia. So uh, would you like to leave us with one Jerry? last thought? Yes. Yeah, I, I want to say thank you. I, I want to apologize for not speaking so clearly or, or quickly enough. Uh, I don't get interviewed enough, frankly. <laughs> well, I have this a feeling good practice. We're, going to, <laughs> we're going to try to change that for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank so, you so much. You're my pleasure. This is Jerry Ashton once again, signing off from WGRNRadio.com's 15 Minutes of Fact. Be sure to follow me and my blogs at the Huffington Post as well, and you'll find me on Twitter as at WrittenOffUSA.